Welcome to all you storm watchers, storm chasers, and linearologists out there. Welcome to another edition of Tempest Talks, where we talk about lean principles and tools and how they apply to our personal and our professional lives. Today, we're continuing our discussion on the EMI continuous improvement journey, and we're talking about visual controls in particular with my good friend, Bob Sterling. <laughs> By way of introduction for Bob, I personally like to call Bob the Renaissance man. Bob's extensive 35 year experience in the aerospace industry, as well as running his own personal businesses, have given him a unique perspective in every role he has ever held. He started out his career as a factory worker and was promoted into various leadership positions for 25 of those years of his service. In those years, <clears throat> he currently works for a large global aerospace company, leading a site of approximately 1,200 employees. Bob is a true linearologist, from working with the lean tools on the shop floor to guiding major corporations through their own lean journeys. Bob took a chance on me <laughs> when he hired me to join his supply chain continuous improvement team at Goodrich. I was the first lean person to be hired outside of the organization. They usually promoted from within. I will be forever grateful to him for taking that chance on an unknown kid. <laughs> Bob is an absolutely fabulous friend, colleague, and boss. And I'm very grateful for his support, not only personally, but professionally as well. So welcome, Bob. We're excited to have you today. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> Did I miss anything? In, oh, no, in man, you made, me, you made me sound fantastic. I love that. <laughs> and you are. <laughs> I have traveled the world with Bob, um, literally. Uh, the first, goodness, it was probably two months into my career in um, the supply chain where we went to China together. That's right. Yeah. And we did, did some that great whole... shopping there. You were yeah. such a shopper in China, right? Yeah, well, I had a good trainer. Barbara was the best. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so it's so good to see you and to and to talk about one of our favorite um, tools of visuals and visual controls. Um, and by way of that, I think of all of my prior employers, uh, you were the one that coined make it visual uh, for me at least. I'm sure it was part of our vernacular at Goodrich, but I remember distinctly you telling me make it visual. What does make it visual mean to you? Well, that, that's kind of interesting. I, I think, you know, making it visual to me is um, keep, keeping things simple, right? I'm a simple-minded guy. And so when I said, hey, make it visual so people can really understand, um, you know, it's like visual information things like in the supermarket aisle, right? Yeah. It, without that kind of information, you wouldn't know where you're going in the supermarket or think about how crazy an airport would be without visual direction in, oh, in an yeah. airport. Um, and then visual controls, of course, managing, you talked about managing business. How would we know, you know, how would we maintain inventory levels and things like that? And then visual management is really where some of my passion is, right? Because the visual management is what's you know, drives us to take actions or to take a different direction, yeah. you know, like a, when a production line or something's not meeting their targets and you need to redeploy resources to, you know, be able to get the output done in a day or, you know, and, and or if they're exceeding targets and, and your visuals are also tracking that so you can redeploy them to other areas that are needed. Yeah. And so when I think of visual management and utilizing visual management or visual controls, um, it's to me, it's that simplistic look at the at, at visuals that cause you to drive or do those sort of things yeah exactly so it's kind of like what's what's driving the organization forward what's making it um what's making it behave the way that it is right that's right exactly yeah um i i learned that from you because i it rings in my ears make it visual make it visual and so on every every tool that i create for be it one of my clients or um anywhere where i've worked before i've always thought about that it's always rung in my ears like how do i take this complex information and make it visual so that the common person knows whether or not life is good or bad that yeah you said it right on you nailed it on the head right how do you understand the health of something or yeah. 
right? Yeah. So with um with your your leadership um you know positions that you've held, it's been quite a few um specifically in operations as well as in the support side of of the organization. What are some of the visuals that you would you know expect to see as a leader? Yeah, yeah, I just. I just mentioned, you know, quite a few of those, right? Directional visuals, visual yeah. controls that cause you to drive you to take actions or, or things like that. I, I really wouldn't know how to manage a shop, you know, without them. And so when you ask, hey, what, what kind would, would I want to see? It's really the kind of visuals that would help us identify problems. Yeah. Um, so we'd have to take action to do, you know, and, and making them more real time. Yeah. Um, so then again, we can resolve those problems as quickly as possible to get the best performance, you know, out, out of our business that we can. Right. Yeah. So that, that when you say, Hey, what kind of visual, I, you know, it's those, those type of effective visuals is, is what comes to mind for me. Yeah, totally. At sometimes some of these corporations, right. When they're starting out in their lean journeys, they're thinking, Oh, make it visual. I guess I need to create lots and lots of visuals, but you and I both know that stuff becomes wallpaper. <laughs> so uh, is there a balance between, you know, overload, visual overload, or, um, or do you think that any visual is a good visual? No, I think, you know, out, outdated visuals or visuals yeah. that you don't, you know, that aren't being responded to, then it's time to take a look and refresh um, th those type of visuals. Um, because like you say, otherwise they become wallpaper, they're not, not effective. And that typically happens uh, when folks have maybe achieved the target or you've accomplished what you put the visual in place for. Uh -huh. Another time maybe where I think visuals become kind of stagnant, if you will, if, if you don't set, the, set them up appropriately. Um, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is people will get complacent if you use a visual and it's signaling something red, but it's red all the time, um, then, then it doesn't cause them to react or, or do the right thing. You, you got to find that balance of that visual control changing and uh, ca causing you to take action. Um, identify, like, for example, identifying where I need to take action or identifying where I need to do something. And then once I do it, hey, it, it gets a process or, or it gets that target uh, to achieve green. Yeah. Um, and then if, if I'm not setting or pushing myself to, to the best performance possible or to set that expectation, if it stays green too long as well, it, it, they stop getting responded to or they become ineffective. So there, there's kind of a, a balance of, of driving those visual controls um, so they don't become wallpaper and they, they continue to be effective and setting the targets appropriately, always driving us to the better place, right? Yeah, totally. So you, you've experienced, I'm sure you've, ex you know, we've experienced that where we talk about, hey, that visual is no longer uh, driving the actions that we need it to drive anymore. We either need to upgrade it, remove it, or, you know, go to the next level of visual control. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm so glad you mentioned that sometimes green visuals, if they stay green, for too long, they're ineffective as well. Cause a lot of, a lot of people, especially with things like 5S, <laughs> yeah, once exactly. they achieve a certain score, they kind of think, oh, I'm done. Wash my hands, I'm done. I don't have to do that anymore. I can focus on something else. But you and I both know that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> there's still a lot that needs to be done, right? And that's part of the reason why I chose the red coat because I normally wouldn't pick a bright red coat, but with visuals and visual controls, usually the colors are red, yellow, green. So that's why I chose the red coat today. It's awesome. <laughs> but um, yeah, to your point, like it's the problem isn't that the, the red light necessarily is on too long or on often. Um, it's how quickly we can turn it from red exactly. to green. I remember you teaching me that too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It can go on as many times as you need it to go on. Again, it's driving action, yeah. right? So if, if, if it's not driving the appropriate actions or the things that you need to achieve what you need to achieve, then you either got to reset the targets or you got to rethink the process behind that visual. Yeah, I love that because um, visuals, Visuals can um, can tie us to a a um, a process like we like we mentioned before, like standard work. So 
of visuals for standard work that we know about, of course, is standard work combination sheet is a visual. Um, the standard worksheet is a visual and a visual control, right? Correct. Um, and our percent load is, is a visual control and a visual as well. Um, I remember one event, <laughs> gosh, it must have been the second year that I had been working with um, for you. Uh, me and Alex Lumine, <laughs> we went, um, Alex and I went up to uh, Riverside to do an event and we were following, we were doing time observations and I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, we were watching this guy, we'll call him Ralph. <laughs> we were watching Ralph um, go through his particular piece of standard work and we were breaking for lunch. So we told Ralph, okay, we're going to see you, you know, we'll see you in a, in a half hour, however long his, his break was. And we came back a half hour later, he wasn't there. Alex and I looked at each other and went, what? Then an hour goes by, what? Where's, where's Ralph? Then an hour and a half goes by and Ralph shows up and we're like, dude, <laughs> we've been waiting here. Your break is only a half hour. And he said, follow me, which I thought was really interesting. So we followed him over to the driver measure board where all of his standard work was. And he said, look at this percent load. So we looked at it and he said, do you see something wrong with that? I went, um, oh, he learned from the visual control, good, bad, or indifferent. He learned from the visual control that he could waste three hours a day and just wander. So <laughs> I didn't know whether to hug him or be really mad. <laughs> But it was an effective visual control, right? Yeah, absolutely. It set the <laughs> expectation of performance one way or the other. Like you said, good, bad, or indifferent, that set the expectation of performance. And yeah. so they're obviously, I'm so proud of you for learning that visual control obviously needed to be reset, right? right. To drive to a new least waste way. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I was like, I didn't know. I looked at Alex and I literally said that. I don't know if I should hug him or be really mad. <laughs> I want it, to, it's a funny story. You talk about there's a visual control setting an expectation. Yeah. I made a bet with one of my peers one of, in, in one of the, in our executive conference room. We'd constantly go into this conference room oh. and we want to turn on the projector and nobody can find the remote. Oh. This happened meeting after meeting after meeting. And he knew I was a visual control nut. And he says, yeah. Sterling, when are you going to come up with something? So when we walk into the room, the TV automatically comes on. Oh. And I said, well, I'm not an engineer, but I am a continuous improvement guy. And I bet you, uh, you know, a steak dinner that if we mark where that where that remote's supposed to be, it'll be there nine out Great of the time. next 10 times we come into this conference room ah. because there's no home location for that remote control. That's why nobody can ever find it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So I went and got, we went and got some like automotive pinstripe and I pinstriped on the conference table, uh, uh, the shadowing of the remote control. And I put remote control label right there. And I won the bet. It wasn't nine out of 10 times that we came into the conference room that the remote was sitting in that location, but it was 10 out of 10 times. Awesome. The next 10, the next 10 times he and I met in that conference room, we didn't have to look to see where somebody put the remote because they'd sit it on the TV, yeah. they'd sit it over on the credenza, but it was never in the same location. So you come yeah. into the room and you're trying to start the meeting and you're, where, where's the remote to turn on the monitor? Where's the remote to turn on the monitor? So anyway, I got the steak dinner out of that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's simple, simple things like electrical tape. Um, I remember building visuals out of popsicle sticks and um, post-it notes and laminating them into little flags. Um, so like really visual controls to me is where really lean becomes fun because it's all about like creativity before capital and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> That's why I said we, we didn't make a fancy holder on the wall. I used automotive pen striping around that table, right? That was That's creativity awesome. before capital. So it was fun. <laughs> so now you know my passion around visual controls. I love to make bets on what they're going to do or how people are going to react to them, right? I love it. That's so great. Well, I win them quite often. Fun. Yeah. I win I those imagine. bets quite a bit. <laughs> I 
I'd imagine. And I like that it's all always a steak dinner because I happen to be a foodie. <laughs> <laughs> so anytime that there's food involved, I'm in. <laughs> Me too. I'm in. 100%. Well, in both your professional, you know, careers of, of being, of course, running your own business, as well as being part of aerospace um, for a good chunk of your career, um, you know, ha how has it made, how have visuals and visual controls made a difference in performance in both worlds? So obviously in the aerospace world, it's tracking, you know, bottom line and stuff, but have you used visual controls in your um, private business or even in your private life? And how has that changed things for you? Yeah, if you think, yeah, ab absolutely. Visual controls still apply. And I, I hate to do it to my son, but I'm going to rat him out here a little bit. Uh, <laughs> we both work construction and we had utility trucks in construction. Uh, when we were on job sites together, he would constantly go to my truck. Um, and I said, why are you going to my truck to get tools or materials and things? He says, because dad, they're always in the same place and they're always labeled. And you got all these labels and all these visuals there. So I know when you're low on nails, you got this red thing that says you need to replenish them. So I know if they're stacked up ab above the green mark that they're, and he knew where my saws were. He knew where my drills were versus his truck. He would, at the end of the job, he'd just throw things in his truck and it was so disorganized, right? And so it used to, he'd say, it's, it's faster to go to your truck and get the tools. That's right. It's faster. So yes. we're performing better when we're doing that, right? So that, that was an example of, you know, working construction with my son. Um, <laughs> when I think of the home life, I probably drive my wife, Anna, crazy, right? Because when we put boxes in storage, uh -huh. right, and we'll have 10 boxes in storage, and then we look, oh, I think it's in this box. I think it's up in a box in storage. And we go up there, and before, you know, she knows I'm a visual control nut, we'd look through all 10 boxes. It'd be the 10th box before you'd find what you're looking for. And so I might drive her crazy, but I'll take a marker and mark on all, all outside the box, exactly what's in that box, or I'll Love number it. the box and make a list of what's in the box. But either way, it's a good visual control to understand totally. what's in that box, as well as, you know, just my tools at, at home. I'll, I'll shadow board my tools at home so I know when something's missing or yeah. if somebody else is using something with me or, you know, we're working like together. <laughs> and yeah, like my son. And we're cleaning up. He knows where to go put it back. Right. Yeah. So that that that's a great example. I mean, we can we're getting a little bit into 5S and shadow boarding, but it's also yeah. that shadow boarding is a visual control and is visual management that causes you to behave differently and yeah. sets a different expectation. That, totally. You know, that, so I'm still working on my son. He's not perfect yet, but <laughs> his truck's a lot more organized now that he's worked with mine. So I think I've convinced him that, you know, if you organize and arrange stuff and put some visuals in place, you'll know where things belong and you'll know where they are when you need to find them, right? <laughs> sure. I know I, I drive Adrian crazy, um, my husband with this, because we've, we have so many decorations so many decorations for Christmas, for Halloween, for Thanksgiving, what, what have you. I've even gone to color coding. Nice. There <laughs> so, you go. I know all the orange totes are Halloween. Halloween and all the green totes are Christmas. I know that. So when I walk into the, um, into the garage, I know exactly what is what, but it also helped out um, when my my family, as you know, has been evacuated several times from wildfires. And um, I've got, you know, personal documents that I don't use all the time that are, of course, stored in the garage. So all of those are in red totes. So I know if I need to evacuate, I'm taking the red totes so that we can go and get out. Um, moving, we both have moved recently as well. <laughs> Um, visuals and visual controls really do help with moving too, a lot. <laughs> so I know these boxes go into the kitchen, these boxes go into the bedroom. <laughs> I know, I know how to arrange things, right? There, it's a beautiful thing. It's awesome. I love the fact that you brought up um, some of the uh, controls of inventory too. So can you talk a little bit more about that um, with the red, yellow, green? inventory type stuff? Yeah, you know, in, in the factory, we use a couple different 
a few different methodologies, but some, you know, when we, when we're looking at Kanban levels or, mm -hmm. or, you know, replenishment levels, if you will, um, we typically will set three categories there and the, wow. the lowest inventory that puts our business at risk would be in a red zone. So if you're thinking, I'll, I'll use shipping as an example, they use a lot of cardboard boxes in shipping. Um, they put all the cardboard boxes on a shelf, right? And they stack right. them all up. And so the top, when, when they're at their maximum level, they're in a green zone yeah. for, for the cardboard. And as those cardboards are consumed, they get into the yellow zone. And so that's a, hey, guys, we better, do we have more cardboard on order? Because we're getting kind of low or whatever. And so that's the time, that's the trigger point to go order more cardboard. Awesome. And then if the cardboard hasn't come in, it gets in the red zone. Uh, people are, you know, on the phone or making calls or finding out, hey, when's the delivery of cardboard? We're in the red zone. So, yeah. you know, you have to, and then again, you have to put the right uh, triggers there to win you know, how long can we survive in the red zone to know yeah. if my cardboard's going to, do I have two days worth? Do I have two hours worth? And so it's setting those triggers in those zones, uh, yeah. again, to take the risk out of the business and stopping uh, for shipping, for example, I'd stop the packers and yeah. you stop from being able to ship that sort of stuff. Another good visual is if you talk about inventory management in the factory, we use a two bin system, right? Oh. So we have if they're consuming like nuts or bolts, we use two bins that are stacked uh, in the some of the material uh, systems uh, in front of each other. So if the green bins in front, they're they're it's it, they're doing good with maybe a reorder card at the bottom of the green bin. Oh, right. So when they consume everything out of the green bin, then they take that out. They use the card. They reorder. The, whatever that hardware is, it could be bolts, rivets, or whatever. And then the red bin comes forward and they put the green bin behind the red bin. But at, at a quick glance, when you walk through the shop, yeah. if you see a bunch of red bins that are in the front, um, it, it you know will drive you to take action or you know you may have a problem coming up depending on what the time uh, is yeah. that you're going to consume out of that red bin. So there was a couple of examples. I hope that makes sense. The answers, yeah, that's you know. fantastic. Because I know, um, I know, as as being a manager at one point in your career, it was over the uh, maintenance team, that's right. the maintenance crew. Um, I know you used a lot of those same kinds of principles with them. Also, um, I mean, if the maintenance crew doesn't have the tools and the resources that they need, that can stop a line, stop a line, and that's a major problem. Oh. So some yeah. of the stuff you were you used for that too. Um, I remember seeing some um, right sized bins for the the longer um, trusses and things and parts for machines as well. That's correct. If you remember the we did a lot of super plastic forming and we had a lot of heating elements in, in that area yes. and the heating elements would constantly they would always wear out. So the maintenance mechanics were changing those heating elements. So we use that same green yellow uh, philosophy on the heating elements where we had, we had them in, they stacked in the green, uh, green bin, a red bin and a yellow bin. And so when they, you know, the green bin's gone, they're getting into the yellow bin that's triggering them to order more heating elements. And then if they're in the red bin, of course, they know we're, we're in the risk of shutting down these furnaces that, you know, are making the uh, profitability in the company. Yeah. You don't want to do that, right? So, no. so it's, so the simplest, like I said, being simple minded or using those simple tools will yeah. take the risk or it's really risk risk avoidance or risk mitigation to just put those simple things in place to drive people to take actions when those things are happening versus the old school. When I first started running factories, we didn't have any of those controls in place. So we constantly had machine, a lot of machine down time yeah. is, could be avoided just by utilizing simple visual controls. And, and like you're, like you mentioned with part replenishment or part ordering or things like that, right? Yeah, it's really interesting because if you think about like the philosophy of lean and some of the more complicated tools like single minute exchange of die or even TPM, um, when you're thinking about those things, <clears throat> most of them are all just about visual management. It's not yeah. really anything too, too complicated, right? It's all yeah. visual management. Type the simpler stuff. the simpler you keep it for the operators the better because then they'll mm -hmm. utilize it as well yeah. um you, you were talking about single minute exchange of dies yeah. how important is it to understand the length the time it takes to change over and change over and do a setup yeah. right and so 
visual management again could be a, <clears throat> a high junk board where yeah. I have my time available in a day and I'm putting orders in to yeah. consume that time. Of, so I know how many orders I can make in a day, but if I have to do a changeover and setup and I didn't put a card in that slot on um, how long it takes, um, I'm going to miss the output for the day. Okay. So you also have to include, you know, changeover setup time or maybe even machine or equipment maintenance time. But that visual of a hijunka board or a scheduling board, probably for easier terms that people don't try to speak that Japanese stuff like we do, <laughs> right. Right? right? It's just a, it's just a simple uh, visual of a scheduling board. So yeah. you have so much time available and you can fill up that time available by making the cycle runs the cards, the length of the cycle runs, if you put the time on the Hijunka board, and I know if it's uh, seven in the morning until three in the afternoon, and I have cycle cards based on the part I want to run, also time the length of that time base, right. and then I know how many parts I can make and utilize that time, including changeover setups or machinery um, preventative maintenance, uh, yeah. the how, how long it takes the mechanic maybe to PM the machine. Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, and the, these are simple things. They're like magnets and and colored cards. And I think one of ours that I remember um, that Audrey Michaels would talk about all the time was the washers, the different colored washers on a giant um, piece of plywood With that just had nails. nails in it. That's right. Amazing. Um, and it, it, that managed million dollar programs. Yeah. It wasn't so, some, you know, computer system that was running that. That's right. You're absolutely right. And the green zone, remember, was good. We yeah. still talk. You and I are yellow, red, yellow, green people. Yeah. I don't know what we would do if we're colorblind, but anyway, yeah. you, we'd have to pick something else. But red, yellow, green works for most of us. Yeah. But if you remember, a lot of the yellow zone in that material consumption yeah. board where they need to order or they're consuming kits or whatever from those washers, but the yellow zone was the supplier lead time, right? Yes. So yes. they set up those zones based on the lead time of the supplier. And that kind of kept them out of trouble. Yeah, it was brilliant because it managed, you know, out time from the freezer too, because a lot of the, the products that they used were consumables. They, if they were out of the freezer, that starts the clock on curing time. So they've got right. to be on top of it. Um, and it, it stopped the loss of lots and lots, lots of consumable of material that is not cheap. Um, that, that stuff is extremely expensive, especially when you're talking about aerospace type grade materials too. Um, very specific for the industry. It's not something that you can just pick up and make a dining room table out of. <laughs> It's, it's funny that you mentioned that board and when we talk about being simplistic with visual yeah, controls yeah. or visual management, because remember, if you remember correctly, the operators manage that whole process yeah, versus, it being, versus it being in a very complicated system, yes. right, that is not, no one else knows if they're in trouble or can see it. But you remember in that factory, we could walk by that board at any time and understand the health of our materials. Totally. Right? So it, it's giving a signal. And not only is it a visual control, but it's visual management uh, yeah. en enabling us to see, are we healthy when it comes to our materials, right? That's yeah. great. That's I funny you it. called that. We called it the Audrey Michaels Million Dollar Board, remember? Because there was millions of dollars. We were managing million do millions of dollars of materials based on a you know $20 sheet of plywood, right? It's incredible. I, when I think back to it, I think like, my goodness, you know, all of these companies, because I've had some companies come toward me and, you know, ask about material uh, or MR, MRP systems, material replenishment um, programs and so forth and, um, and programs or systems, I mean. Um, I've had lots of people ask me about them, like, oh, is SAP the best? Is Sage the best? Uh, which one do I use? <laughs> and I'm sitting in the back going, I have a hammer and nails and washers. How about that? <laughs> Let's Just give that use a the try. system to order. You <laughs> exactly. only need the system to order it at the supplier, but we can yeah, manage it right spend. here. Don't spend that money. Let's let's try something else first. That's uh, that takes me back to the popsicles and the and the right. um, post-it notes again. Um, literally, all we did with those, um, we used them in foley. Um, we took popsicle sticks because they were wider, like tongue tongue suppressants or that's, that's suppressors right. or whatever. Suppressors. And um, we would drill a hole in the bottom of them and stick a hanger, just a wire hanger, through them. 
and then um, laminate uh, the post-it notes on the top in different colors. So they were red, yellow, green, because we finally found red post-its. <laughs> I remember that. Um, and they would use them to indicate whether or not they were in their cubicle or not. So they would flip up a flag and it would show I'm in the office. If it's green, I'm in the office and I can have people approach me. I'm not in, in the middle of something. Um, uh, Zach, I don't, I, I don't know if you remember this, but when Zach Tanous in the finance department was so crazy busy, he would put up caution tape <laughs> across funny. the door of his, his cubicle um, as well to let people know, hey, I'm in month end. Like, don't, bo <laughs> can't don't bother, bother me. me. Um, simple visual controls that are not that expensive. So you probably remember the Andon system before oh, yeah. Mexicali, before we were able to get power to all those assembly lines, we used uh, different color solo cups on a PVC yes. pole. That's Remember? right. The operators almost like that better than light. They just changed the, you know, the they restacked the, restack the solo cups. But, and, but again, the red ones were easy to find. It was the green ones and the yellow ones that were more challenging. <laughs> that and we actually found white ones and blue ones, I think. The blue oh, ones wow. didn't, wasn't that I needed quality. If I remember, oh, it was yes, the signal I need yes. a quality or I need an inspector, right? Yeah. I think that was, it's been a while. Mexicali has been a while for me, but if I remember right, it had to do with the blue meant we need inspection. Yeah. How beautiful is that? Because, you know, a lot of the, the management staff who didn't speak the language, especially us going over to China too, yeah. um, that visual control communicated where we may not have been able to use language to tell them what was wrong they could see something was wrong because it visually indicated it for it. Um, I remember uh, you, re you talking about um, colorblind, uh, folks that are colorblind and how rough it was. There were a couple people, I don't know if you remember in, um, in supply chain that were colorblind. So I got into the habit of as a facilitator, walking into the room going, okay, who we got that's colorblind <laughs> before we start doing this kind of stuff because it changes things. So now we're looking at symbols. So this, uh, the star represents X, Y, Z. The, the moon represents X, Y, Z. Those square circles, triangles. Yes. Remember the square circles, square triangles, circles, triangles, triangles, red, yellow, green. I recall doing yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, again, it's where creativity uh, really comes into play. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's a, it's a lot of fun doing that kind of stuff. I, I remember you always challenging me, Hey, I can't just walk up to this visual that you just created, um, and know whether or not life's good or bad. It's, I, it's too much reading. Try to get rid of all the reading. <laughs> Tell me, I remember you challenging me, um, for that. And it, I'm better. I'm a better person for it. For sure. I said, Michelle, I don't want to have to need a decoder ring. Remember? <laughs> Michelle, yes. where's the decoder ring for this visual control? Right? Yes. I, I hate picking on you, but that was a. It's that so was true, it. though. <laughs> I'm I'm a much better person and a much better facilitator for it too. The um, simple, the better. Yes. Um, most executive teams, as as you've experienced, because you spend a lot of time with executive teams, um, they tend to overcomplicate things, especially when they're you know putting board packs together or policy deployment packs and stuff like that together. Um, how do you approach an executive team and kindly tell them your metric makes no sense? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, really, that's really challenged because people become emotionally attached to the things yes. that they create, right? It's true. Um, and then that, that when they become, they start working in their emotional mind, it loses their effectiveness. And so it's really hard. Um, and I've done it. I, I've yeah, done that myself, right? I created this great visual control and I think it's going to be the best thing since sliced bread and it's too complicated, but I worked so hard on it. I became so emotionally attached to it. Yeah. Um, so again, you got to validate it with your customers and the people that need to use it um, to see is it effective or not? Um, because you don't want to make I mean, it, you know, you need a good visual control. So you're making decisions based on facts and data, right? Yeah. We've always talked about that too, you and I, yeah. versus a, opinion and assumption. Mm -hmm. And if a visual control is not working effectively, 
we kind of end up making decisions based on what we think or yeah. based on an opinion or based on an, we're, we're trying to make an assumption what that's trying to tell us versus the visual control is really driving us to the true fact or yes. real data, right? Is that, totally. you know, you remember those conversations, yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. And everybody, um, I think I think somebody in the back held up a post-it note that said, that's a fact. <laughs> in <laughs> that's, one of our events, if you awesome. remember. <laughs> that's a fact not your an opinion this is a fact <laughs> kind we, of, uh, we we are we are still using I, I will call them cheesy to your point right in 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 a factory i'm in today we still use a very simple uh, visual management board in cool. in each of our production cells uh, we recently had one of the largest airline customers uh, come into our factory and it was really cool to hear the compliments that we got because they thought the the simple visuals that we had on our factory floor were, and they used the term much more effective for your operators to understand because they said, we just went to a beautiful factory. It's a, one of your competitors and everything was electronic. And when we talked to the operators, they didn't have a clue what was happening or what was going on, but we came to your factory and not only were your visual boards and controls so simple and kind of, I call them cheesy, you know what I mean, but creativity before capital, they said, but your operators could walk up and explain them to us and walk us through them. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. The, one of my, um, one of the folks that I was talking to recently, they have an overabundance of visuals, like an overabundance of visuals. So you remember those old Obea rooms that we had. Yes. Um, <laughs> the one of those rooms, I remember walking into it because we spent the whole weekend building it. Um, there were over 2,400 pieces of charts on the wall. And I remember putting it on the wall. And when I walked in, your voice <laughs> in my head, this is all wallpaper. No one's going to look at this. No one's going to walk up to that board and look at it. And one of the other things that I think about as well is once it's printed, so this is what a lot of people don't think about when they're thinking about metrics. Um, once it's printed, it's outdated. So how do I make it simple, right? That I can use it and it not have it be outdated, right? So, I've thought a lot about that too, because some of these things like, uh, um, you know, our, our um, percent load charts, that's printed. <laughs> so does that mean it's outdated? No, right? Because it's the cycle time as we know it today. So what's live and what the live metric is, is a tack time clock to tell us whether or not we're on tact or not, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a different way of thinking about visuals as well, because sometimes some of these, especially in the executive levels, they think I need loads of charts in order to make decisions, but that's not necessarily true, right? That's correct. Remember my rule, can you walk up to the visual control from 10 feet away and understand if life is good or bad in 10 seconds or less, right? Yes. My 10, 10 rule, right? 10, 10 rule. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and it made huge changes on our driver measure boards too. That's correct. Because yeah. there was a ton of stuff on there that we didn't care about. It was, that's something that we can report out at the PDPR level every six to 11 weeks. What is driving behavior? That needs to be on the driver measure board. I remember yeah. having those conversations too. What drives behavior? What drives the actions? What's the key performance indicator that yeah. they that they can take action on. It can't be the score at the end of the game. It's right. gotta be what plays do we need to put in the game next to win, right? Yes. yes, yes. Which gets us into that whole discussion about driver metrics versus results metrics. That's right. You remember, <laughs> I'm so proud of you, Michelle. <laughs> it's ingrained, it's ingrained. Um, and it's all goodness too, because I, when I walk in to evaluate um, an organization, because you and I used to do, um, you know, lean, lean journey um, evaluations on people, <laughs> particularly our suppliers. Um, I remember one um, that you and I went to, I think it was in Texas. Um, we walked in and there was a circle on the floor that said trash can. 
and there was no trash can there. And I remember <laughs> asking <laughs> the leader who was taking us on this tour, this grandiose tour of all these amazing things that they're done, that they're doing. And I pointed at the floor and I said, where's your trash can? <laughs> and he panicked. He's like, oh my gosh, where is the trash can? And I said, that shows the visual control is working, right? And he said, yeah, but the trash can's over there. And it was right next to the table that the operator was working on, not at the aisle. Do you remember this? Yes. Okay. And, um, and I remember, I think it was you that asked. So if your visual is here, but the operator needs it there, why is there a visual here? <laughs> So we got into that point of use conversation, yes, right? Exactly. Exactly. It's simple things like that that people don't think about. That, you know, what is my visual actually telling somebody to do? Is it is it actually following standard work? Is it supporting standard work? Um, is it supporting linkage and flow? Or is it not? So again, it goes back to can I walk into the factory and from this spot? know what's happening because um one of uh one of my friends was asking me how long should a gemba walk take what's your opinion on how long a gemba walk should take Ooh, that that depends on the size of the what, what you're gimp what you're walking of course because i've been a multi-size factory spy but i like to say are your visual controls or is your visual management good enough that i can walk through the factory at a fast pace and understand if life is good or bad in every cell that's right? awesome yes. yeah 10 10 10 rule again yeah at the 10 10 rule i want to go through you know and see that visual in 10 seconds or less from 10 feet away and understand if life if health is good or bad yeah yeah exactly right that's awesome have you received any um any resistance to visuals and visual controls being put in place? And what did you do if there was resistance? Yeah, yeah, I think the, the resistance uh, a lot of times is the lack of knowing or you know, giving the why factor, right? Yeah. What, why do we need this visual control? What is it telling us? Um, and what what's the expectation of responding to you can like take and on lights for example or the sh or the shop floor management board when there's a red condition mm -hmm. if we don't respond to those or react to those um they they don't do any good so then the for, in two sides right the operators become resistant to helping you manage them or utilize them because they're not being responded to. So that's in, in, ineffective. So there's some discipline, I think, that has to go along with visual controls and visual management. Um, and, and I always say, hey, that's our that's our lead. That's where you got to be servant leadership or servant support uh, folks. Right. Um, I don't do anything value added in the company. Um, the operators are making all the value added stuff, the things that make money in the fact what I do, it makes no money. Yeah, right? but what they do makes money. So you got to focus it, I think, on the operators. Um, and so the resistance first, you got to help your leadership understand their role uh, mm -hmm. or the responders or the support teams and the support staff. Why, why is it so important that we're responding to the operators needs? And again, I'm strictly manufacturing operations kind of guy. So it could be different in other types of businesses, but you're you're at what I know is that I'm saying, right? So that uh, you, utilizing those visual controls to get the operators what they need, when they need it, how much they need it, and how they need it is the key. I, you know, we go back, and I don't know if you recall even the trash can story that you talked about. Uh -huh. If I remember correctly, it was at the aisle. Yes. You know, the people were passionate where it was at the aisle because that's where the custodial staff or whoever came to yes. empty it. Yes. You know, right? But, and, but I think if we remember, we asked a question, but where is 80 to 90% of its use needed? Yes. It's not at the aisle for the custodian to empty it. It's at that workstation for the operator to put his bot or whatever it was in there, exactly. right? So it, it again, it comes back to, you know, sometimes just being a little more uh, realistic or putting sensibility to, to things like that, so. Totally, it's, um, it's interesting because, um, if we if we think about you know 5s of course uh, use utilizes point of use which is a visual and visual control as well. I remember um, from a previous life, 
<laughs> we were losing um, air drills and air drills, as you know, are extremely expensive, really, really expensive. And we just simply, we put in a simple visual control and I had the conversation with the whole staff saying, nobody leaves until all the air drills are back where they belong, right? Nobody leaves. Our stealing problem, non-existent. It ended it. Because now all of a sudden we're accountable to something. So visual controls also add accountability too. Um, I think where some leadership um, mess up, um, and, and I'm sure you can agree with this, is where they, they overcomplicate the communication through visuals um, to their staff to the point where their staff now is self-conscious about, I don't understand that visual, I'm expected to understand that visual, and I don't know how it impacts me, so I feel like an idiot, so I'm just not going to communicate about it which is really a bad culture to harvest, right? Have you seen that in some of the places that you've been? Yeah, it, it take, and again, it's, it's us taking time to, to educate and per, I, I always call it provide the why, you know, you gotta give the why factor and, and make sure people under, understand it. You know, it's the, the whole journey of awareness, understanding, commitment at it. Right. Yes, um, totally. If you provide the awareness and you, you got to keep working that until you get get them to understand the why, then they'll commit to it. Yeah. And after a while, after you commit to things for so long, it, then it becomes the natural habit. Right. That's the true totally. journey of, of being effective at something. You know, awareness, understanding, commitment, habit. We always go down that journey. Yes. Right. You remember always. that, too. Yeah. Always. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, it's interesting. You talked about the drills. Um those things also have a major effect on quality. So yes. you, you triggered a thought for me on visual controls and drills. If you remember in one of the factories we worked in, the speed of the drill had a lot to do with the quality when they were drilling apart. Yes. And they had various speeds of drills and often the part would get, uh, uh, you know, it'd get messed up or, you know, it, it caused some damage because the wrong speed of drill was using. So remember we put in the standard work and we color coded the drills based yeah. on the speed and then the level of standard work. So that's a visual control that drew, drove quality. So we, we have talked about all the different types of things that visual controls can do and what they can manage. Um, but even not, not just a performance expectation or cycle times or those things, but it can have a huge impact on the quality output um, just yeah. by putting the right visual controls in place too. So that was a great example because I think in the one line you and I did a Kaizen event in, mm -hmm. there was like four different speeds of drills yeah. or something like that. And so once we color coded the speeds of drills and we put it into the standard work, use the green stripe drill yeah. or whatever it was we did. I think we used tape. Tape, or something it was electrical it. tape. Their, their, remember their quality metrics? It, their, their yield, their, their, their yield improved, remember? Or their rework or something, right? The whatever yeah. metrics we were tracking there. So. It's amazing. Visual controls. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing how that how that happens. Because yeah, if you if we think about it, we talked about inventory control, which controls delivery and cost. We talked about um, delivery, of course, from product being made at, at one site and moving to another. We talked about quality, how visual controls handle quality as well. I also think it, it handles culture too. Absolutely. Yes. So in what ways do you think visual controls impact culture? in a good way. Visual controls impacting culture. Boy, that's a, that now you're, you're getting into some challenging questions to me now. Um, <laughs> I, I, in, when I think of culture, I think of their, their ability to engage, right? Um, so I always call it uh, a visual control, like a to-do list on our shop floor management board to me is a visual control. I'm giving the power of the pen to the operator Yes, and that changes a huge culture in most factories when an operator can go to a board and write down any problem or issue or opportunity that they're having in their workday, whether it's based on any of those things that you just talked about, yeah. or whether it's based on the temperature in the factory, I'm too hot, I need a fan, or the lights flickering, and it's making it hard for me to concentrate. Again, it could be any problem. And I always tell the operators, you, you own the first half of that to do list. It's the date. Who put it there? What's the problem, issue, and opportunity? And then I tell my servant leadership, 
we own the second half, right? What's yeah. the countermeasure? You got to partner with that person that put the problem issue or opportunity in there. We've got to identify the right countermeasure to go put yeah. in place. When are we going to have it done? And who's going to do it, right? So yeah. to me, that that's a, another visual control that drives culture. And it really, really, and the factories, that, that's why I get so passionate about just a simple to-do oh. list in an area, oh, because yeah. it really changes the culture of the operators really feeling like we're serving them as leaders. And I tell them all the time, you, they'll come to me and say, hey, you know, I, I really like working for you, boss. And I said, no, you don't work for me. I work for you. What yeah. do you need? What do you got? Right. You're the value-added person. That's a hard culture shift uh, for it today, is. but it really changes performance and it changes the culture. So I guess maybe that's one of the mo most passionate stories I have about a visual control changing yeah. or driving the culture. And when you think, and so I'm going to use the factory that I've been in here for the last year and the stage of that journey that we're in. Yeah. So currently when an operator comes to me and says, you know, as you're walking through your shop and somebody wants something, right. And they'll tell yeah. you it and you say, yep, I'll, 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 I'll be glad to take care. And you walk off yeah. and you, you forget about it. You go to a meeting exactly. or you go somewhere else and you come back. And now that operator just, they may not ever tell you, say, tell you something again, because they think you don't care, right. Exactly. Or because you didn't address it. So totally. now I try, I try to get my, my leaders to make a conscious effort. If they tell you something in the beginning of this journey, say, okay, wait, come with me, walk over to them yeah. to the to-do list and write it for them. Say, what was that you had again? And you write it for them. Right. And say, okay, that's great. The next time, the next step of the journey, you're going to walk through the fact and they tell you something else. Say, Hey, do you remember last time we wrote that on the to-do list? Can you go do that for me? Cause I got to get off to this meeting because I don't want to lose what you're saying. Cause what you're telling me could be it's very important. Stuff. It could be key to the business. Right. Yeah. And then eventually they won't even bother you with it. They'll go write it. And then as you're having your morning shift start meetings or your gimbal walks, right now you can there. Oh, wow. There's yeah. not my folks say, Hey, that's success. When operators are putting things on that to-do list, that's cultural success without, you know, anybody yeah. or anybody forcing them. And then also you can really see the, I always say you, you can tell the health of the culture by the amount of items on the to-do list. Yes. So sometimes when they yes. change the sheet, right, I always tell them throughout the year is we have customers, we have audits and, mm -hmm. and they want to know, well, how, how effective do you think this process really is? And I say, well, come here, let's see. Yeah, let's go and see. And what I have them do is I don't let them renumber the sheet when they put a new sheet up. Good. I have them continue the number of the sheet. You might remember this. We mm -hmm. did this in some of the factories. And we said, hey, for this year, you're going to start with the to-do list item number one. And every time you change a sheet, if it's only 12 items on that to-do list, start the next sheet with 13. 13. Start the next sheet, right? Yeah. And so I said, how active is this area? Oh, come here. Come here. And I, I showed an auditor just recently. This area's had, oh, oh, we're in August, right? Oh, look, there's 1,824 yeah. items on this to-do list That's just huge. this year, right? And I tell them, okay, you can start back at number one in, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, right? I love but once that. I once I drove that culture and understood that culture, did a couple of things, right? They they take pride in finding now they're taking pride in finding problems, issues, and opportunities. Exactly. And if they stay, those problems, issues, and opportunities stay hidden in a business, the culture will never progress and they won't become mm -hmm. problem finders for you. Our yes. job is problem solving. Their job is problem finding, right? Yes. Yeah, that's oh, the culture. I love that. Okay. I love that. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because um, when, I, when I was at Tesla, one of the big things that I was trying to get my service managers to understand is what problem are we trying to solve? Because somebody would come up and tell me, oh, this is, you know, this isn't functioning, right? You need to change this. And I'd go, ah, time out. What problem are we trying to solve? <laughs> so I constantly have them stop and think about what am I writing on the to-do list? Um, when I started doing that um, with them, they were actively putting real problems that were gonna make a big impact. It wasn't just, hey, this, um, this tool goes missing all the time. It wasn't just, um, I, need a new, I need a new pair of gloves. It was, where are all the gloves going? Because we're ordering all of these gloves. <laughs> where are they going? So we were starting to ask better questions and so I would always challenge my, um, my teams, what problem are we trying to solve? Which also 
adds to the culture as well, right? Because now they're learning and they're realizing, oh, I'm part of the solution as well. So right. by understanding what the real problem is, I can actually, you know, make a big impact in the organization that I may not have been able to do before. Um, which is so interesting because, you know, we're talking about simple tools. A to-do list is one sheet of paper with a date a on it with the problem, countermeasure, who's doing it and when. Like, that's it. <laughs> Just a rail, a rolling actions list, right? <laughs> but some people have such a hard time using it. And it's wild to me because it's just like, come on, I love that. Come with yeah. me. I don't want to lose it. Help me write it. So what are you actually, you know, telling me to write here? What's the problem? I love that because it's training them and coaching them into being better problem solvers themselves too. So yeah. they, they benefit from it too. Um, Michelle, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Wow, oh, you're you're like, it's all it's all it's all in there now, right? It is. It's, all there. It's, in there. it's in my DNA. <laughs> it's so then, true. But you're right. I, I I gotta tell you, you're you're you you're spot on because if we're not identifying the right problem, and sometimes we still identify the wrong problem. Yeah, but we it's, do. But but then it's uh, getting the leadership team or the, and getting the cal collaboration with the operator to make sure we put the right countermeasure in place. Yes. So I'll yes. use an example recently, an example recently in one of the to-do lists when I walked the factory, it said, no forklift available, need, we need to buy more forklifts, <laughs> right? And so first of all, the, the questions were, and so I, I started challenging the group. Yeah. Really, we want more forklifts, more danger in the factory, more opportunities for yeah. people to get ran over. Why are we using a forklift? Why do we need a forklift? How do yes. we eliminate the forklift? How do and you find out because they're moving stuff, you know, too much or they shouldn't be yeah. moving it? How do we get that where we don't have to need a forklift? And it makes them think totally different, right? Yeah. Now we might not be able to eliminate the forklift, but it's fun having that conversation to your point. Did we identify the right problem? Because right. you identify the wrong problem and right away you're going to put in the wrong countermeasure. Yeah, exactly. So you gotta, that collaboration has to happen, right? Exactly. Oh my goodness. I love it because it's, it's true. Because really all lean is, is simple tools that's teaching people how to think differently and problem solve. That's it. Um, a lot of times when I come into um, contact with certain uh, lean consultants who will remain nameless. <laughs> There's they they come into it with this is the only way that X Y Z can be used, yeah. and that breaks my heart because that's not the true theory behind lean and the purpose of lean. Lean is supposed to be a collaborative effort to come to a solution that works best for whatever that team is. So a standard work combination sheet may not be the right form of standard work for a team. <coughs> Excuse me. It may be, you know, a, a set of process steps at this point in time, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a good way to think about it. And I think that's why the two of us have latched so much on to visual management because we challenge, we get to challenge even the lean tools and ask, is that the right tool for this process too? Um, which is like what you're saying with, is that the right countermeasure that we're putting in place? Is that the right tool that we should be using here? Or are we creating a new tool that's going to be more meaningful for the team? And I love that. Um, it's so lean is so creative and so collaborative and inclusive. Yeah. And I wish people, um, instead of being afraid of it, um, would embrace that side of it. And, and I'm so grateful to, um, employers like yourself that taught me that, um, that I can challenge some of those things and it's okay. <laughs> That's great. So Keep it simple. That. I'm a simple-minded exactly. guy. If you got to, if you can keep it simple, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Remember, I started the company as a plumber. Yes, yes. I, was, I, I love plumber. that you would always um, introduce yourself as, "Hi, I'm the plumber." <laughs> <laughs> Even if you were the the manager 
have the organization at that point in time. It was, hi, I'm the plumber. <laughs> It, it's great. It, it's been it's been so great to talk to you about visual. You just re, it renews my passion all the time when we have these conversations, because you know the simpler we keep them, the better it is for the operator. I to, I swear today, and uh, you know one of the reasons I was bought to this factory is, and I wouldn't know any other way to run or manage the business without visual controls. Amen. How, how are they doing it in that company? Right? They're they're definitely not efficient. They're not effective, and they're definitely have a hidden factory right yeah the whole purpose of it is to unhide all the hidden waste in a factory i love it that's fantastic well bob this has been absolutely fantastic i really appreciate you taking the time out of your very very busy schedule um to speak with me um this has been fabulous i i awesome. i'm renewed as well and i hope Thank that you. you'll come back at some point and chat with us again absolutely i'm so excited for what you're doing thanks for having me Thank you so much. We'll 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 stay in touch <laughs> for sure. Thanks for everything. You're welcome. <laughs> See ya.